Hello, everyone, and welcome to Dana Farber's Department of Data Science Frontiers in Biostatistics Seminar. My name is Erica Fike, and I am the program manager for the department. If you have a question for the speaker or the organizer, please use the Q&A tab. Our faculty organizers will manage the Q&A session during and after the talk. With that, I will turn it over to Nabiha Teo, who will introduce our speaker. Hi, everybody. Welcome to our first um, Frontiers in Biostatistics seminar of the fall season. Today, we have the great pleasure of having Dr. Holly Janes with us. Dr. Holly Janes is a biostatistician, biostatistician working on the design and analysis of vaccine studies with a particular expertise in HIV prevention and vaccine science. She also develops and applies statistical methodology for evaluating biomarkers for risk prediction and optimizing treatment decisions. She is the lead statistician for the HIV vaccine trials network and in, this, in her capacity develops and analyzes HIV vaccine trials. This work involves a spectrum of research from collaborative analysis of immunology data to the design of sequential monitoring strategies for phase three clinical trials. Today, Dr. Janes is gonna be talking to us about the COVID vaccine efficacy trials, open questions and statistical challenges. So welcome Dr. Janes and we we'll look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Nabiha, and thanks for inviting me. I wish I could be there in person and see what this group is like. So I'll do my best over, over this platform. And um, uh, what I'm gonna be talking about today is, if I can get this to advance, there we go. Um, so this is research um, under the auspices of what is has been um, termed uh, the COVID prevention network. So early after the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, it was uh, de decided that um, like, you know, like the HIV prevention networks and, and treatment networks that many of you are familiar with, uh, with, with a lead uh, uh, center in, at, at Harvard, um, it was decided by NIH that, that a useful structure for structuring and coordinating um, the COVID vaccine and prevention research that was funded by the US government would be to set up a, a similar type of network structure. And really anyone who um, previously worked in infectious disease as, as part of the um, NIAID funded um, HIV networks was, was pivoted to, to work on COVID trials. And this COVID prevention network was formed, which is really an amalgam of, of people working on, um, on uh, previously on HIV prevention and other infectious disease prevention and, and therapeutic trials uh, funded by NIAID. And, um, and this became the, the focal point for all US government funded COVID-19 vaccine and monoclonal antibody research. And what I'm gonna comment on is, um, is, is the work that's been underway with regard to the vaccine development and evaluation um, with, with key leadership um, for that program being, being um, uh, contributed by Larry Corey, close colleague of mine at the Fred Hutch and Kathy Noisel at University of Maryland and a, um, a ably led by a statistical um, leadership of Dean Fullman at NIH and Peter Gilbert, who I know many of you know um, uh, well, given his, um, his Harvard uh, pedigree. So um, what I'll go through is, is um, really just trying to um, uh, review and, and provide some insights into the design, the, 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 the what and the how of the um, phase three trial designs to develop and, and evaluate COVID-19 vaccines. Um, I'll give a high level summary of the result to date, but this is really not um, focused on results, more on um, uh, ap approaches and open challenges. And, and then I'll, I'll try to use that to, to pivot to discussing some open scientific questions that remain and, and try to highlight some statistical um, issues uh, in, the, in whatever time remains. So, um, so for, for those of you not you know, living in this day to day, this is a reminder of the um, the five phase three trials that um, that were that um, uh, still are being conducted to evaluate um, candidate COVID nineteen vaccines. Um, all these trials are still underway, and and the principle um, from the get go was to to choose to evaluate um, a, a broad array of different vaccine platforms, ranging as you can see here from a novel mRNA vaccine platform 
to um, more familiar and established vaccine platforms, including uh, viral vector-based vaccines and protein-based vaccines um, to really uh, enhance the chances of success and, and of identification of effective COVID-19 vaccines. Um, another principle was to, to go big, go large, um, so that these trials could be conducted and, and give um, results to the field in, in a very rapid fashion. And, um, and you can see the timeline uh, shown on this slide, which is that um, you know, the first two of these trials went into the field in, in, in summer of 2020. And, and uh, the fir first result that, that was um, reported was, was that of the, the Moderna trial in November 2020, rapidly leading to emergency use authorization of that vaccine by the US FDA and, and rollout throughout all our communities. Um, and, and you can see here that, that three of these other trials have uh, reported results, the AstraZeneca trial in March of 2021, the Janssen trial um, in January 2021, and, and the Novavax study in June of 2021, with um, uh, the Janssen uh, product having received emergency use authorization and the AstraZeneca and Novavax still not uh, re re receiving emergency use authorization, uh, but in conversations with the FDA. The, the last of these trials, the Sanofi trial, um, was actually recently launched. Um, there were some, some scientific steps that needed to be taken before that trial could be launched. It was launched in May 2021, and so the results of, of that study are still pending. Um, so this is a high-level overview just to try to give us uh, the timeline and lay of the land. And, and, um, and, I, and I want to articulate what, what the principle was of these trials from, from the beginning. Um, there was a lot of discussion uh, from the beginning as to how these multiple vaccine candidates should be evaluated uh, and, and entertainment of an idea of a, of a um, multi-arm platform type uh, trial with um, putting multiple vaccine candidates up to head to head against a shared placebo arm. And, and that was uh, eventually disbanded, which was not a surprise to, to those of us who've worked in this field for years. Um, it, was, it was determined that, that that would not be an expeditious way to, to launch these trials, that it would instead be faster, more efficient, to, to conduct multiple parallel phase three trials, allowing those products to, to kind of um, uh, reach their, their timelines for, 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 get, for getting into a phase three trial and their own individual timelines and allow the, the developers, the vaccine developers who were the sponsors of these trials, um, some more autonomy in terms of um, the desired autonomy for, for dictating their own trials. Um, but, but instead what was done was to, to um, you know, through the CoVPN to, to um, conduct what we called harmonized phase three trial designs. Um, so considerable effort was spent, especially by the statistical group, to, to really maximize um, harmony across these multiple phase three trials. And, and what that meant was, you know, that, that we wrote the, the, the first draft protocol and the first draft statistical analysis plan, which was used as the basis for what became the protocols and the analysis plans for each one of these phase three trials. And, and really served as, as a very crucial tool for um, ensuring that we had um, as similar as possible um, primary and secondary endpoints for these trials, as similar as possible uh, specimen collection, visit schedules, and so on. Uh, another um, key attribute was, was uh, creating a common data safety monitoring board that oversaw um, all of these trials and therefore had insight and visibility into the data that were emerging from each one of these trials. And also what was another um, a uh, key uh, player in terms of enhancing har harmonization across the trials. As well, uh, there were common um, immunological laboratories that are used for characterizing immunodicity, uh, another critical tool for ensuring that, that the immune responses can be uh, compared across these trials and, and really um, laying the groundwork for study of um, immunological correlates of, of risk and correlates of protection, which I'll talk about uh, later in the talk. And so all this was really made possible by, by the setting up, you know, by, by the, the creation of this common statistical group, um, which is, which is a, um, a, 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 consists of statisticians at the Fred Hutch, at, at NIH, and at BARDA, um, and, and um, a framework that was laid from the get-go to ensure that the data from all these trials would um, be shared, would be transferred to the COVID-APN statistical group to allow for um, a, a, a host of, of secondary exploratory analyses and, and importantly cross protocol analyses um, to be conducted not just by investigators within the CoVPN, but importantly now um, that that process is playing out and, and these data sets will be available 
to any investigator who, who, who submits a proposal and has a cogent scientific question. So this is really, um, I think, uh, critical for advancing science and ensuring um, open sharing of data from these trials. So I'm gonna go through briefly the, the high level um, statistical design specifications of these trials. Um, and the, the, the first principle of these trials was that, with, as I mentioned, that the, the strategy was to go large, um, recruit very broadly um, from, from the general population. Um, these trials recruited individuals who were 18 and over who, who were deemed by the, by the trial site to be at appreciable risk of infection and subsequent disease. And importantly, um, there was no um, laboratory pre-screening for prior infection. The, the thinking here was that we wanted to ensure that these trials generated data on safety and efficacy that would generalize to the, to the general population and wouldn't, for instance, result in a, in a regulatory decision that, that um, one required um, uh, testing before um, administration of vaccination. Um, uh, the, the recruitment um, sought to enrich for individuals who are at high risk based on their age, comorbidity, or, age, or race, ethnicity. And uh, given the high burden of um, COVID in um, underrepresented minority populations, especially in the US, it was um, a really a, a critical um, requirement that, that underrepresented minorities be enrolled at or above their US demographic frequencies in, in these US government funded trials. Um, the participants who were enrolled were randomized either in a two to one or a one to one ratio to the experimental vaccine or placebo with the um, advantage of a two to one randomization being a slight efficiency gain with regard to evaluating vaccine efficacy. But really more importantly, it, it, it um, prepared us for more powerful um, uh, analysis, more powered, higher, greater power for analyses that restrict attention to vaccinees. And, and that's really critical for um, studying immune correlates, as I'll get back to later, and, and currently um, what is um, uh, being um, uh, discussed is administrative of booster vaccinations to, to vaccine recipients. So both of these, um, both these questions, um, it's turning out to be a, a great advantage for trials that used a two-to-one randomization. Um, the, the trials were, were planned to ensure that participants would be followed at least two years post last vaccination to really definitively uh, evaluate both safety, long-term safety and efficacy. But of course, um, there was um, uh, considerable attention played to lay the groundwork for group sequential interim monitoring to allow for the, the, the reporting of uh, trial results in the, in the event that there was definitive and early evidence of either harm, inefficacy or high efficacy of the vaccines. Um, the, the primary endpoint that, that was chosen for each of these trials was virologically confirmed symptomatic disease. And, and this was evaluated in um, the primarily, the primary analysis was in subset of people who are, who are SARS-CoV-2 negative at enrollment. So this is the subset of people who were thought most likely to be benefited by vaccination. Um, and, and as is quite common in vaccine trials, only counting events that occurred a certain lag, often 14 days, um, post last vaccination. And this is, this is uh, to allow a chance for the immune response to mount post last vaccination. Um, although of course um, there were secondary analyses performed in all these trials that, that um, included all um, enrolled participants and counted all events post randomization. Um, so this is a schematic of the, the, the sort of uh, visit schedule and specimen collection for the prototypical trial here for a, for a two dose regimen. Um, which I neglected to say that, that all of these vaccines, all four of the five vaccine regimens that have been studied in phase three trials funded by the USG uh, are two dose regimens. Only the Janssen vaccine is a, is a single dose regimen. And, um, and, and here, what I wanna illustrate is, is the, the, um, the fact that the, the endpoint collection comes from um, uh, weekly querying of participants as to signs and symptoms that are consistent with COVID. If a participant had signs and systems, symptoms consistent with COVID, they were then brought into the clinic for confirmatory PCR testing. And, um, and so uh, if the PCR was positive, coincident with the protocol set of uh, signs and symptoms that constituted a, a COVID endpoint. So all the PCR testing that was done over the course of these trials was symptom prompted. Um, there was um, non-symptom prompted or kind of cross-sectional um, uh, application of serology as shown using the blood uh, uh, figures here um, to enable secondary analyses, uh, looking at the ability of these vaccines to prevent 
acquisition of infection as, as captured by seroconversion. And I'll talk about that a bit later. So a lot of discussion early on around what would be the, the optimal and ideal uh, endpoint for these COVID vaccine trials. Um, at one end of the spectrum down here at the bottom, well, well, I'll just say, so, so, so we kind of, um, you know, think of infections at the top there as being either symptomatic or asymptomatic. And then among symptomatic infections, of course, we can um, view them as being either severe or non-severe. And, and we considered all these categories of, of, uh, of clinical events as potential primary endpoints for these trials. At, at one extreme at the bottom left there, uh, kind of the endpoint of most critical public health importance is, of course, the prevention of severe disease and death due to COVID. Um, but um, that, that's a, a relatively rare endpoint, especially in the context of a phase three trial where participants are getting excellent clinical care. Um, and um, at the other end of the spectrum, at the top there, looking at SARS-CoV-2, the ability of vaccines to prevent acquisition of infection, um, that was discarded as a primary endpoint um, primarily because even though that would be a much more frequent event, um, experience with many vaccines and especially vaccines against respiratory pathogens has suggested that these vaccines tend to be much more effective at preventing symptomatic disease than actually at preventing infection. And, and so um, kind of given all these considerations, um, the, the, the decision was to, to choose symptomatic uh, infection in, in the middle there as the primary endpoint with, with the greatest likelihood of, of capturing a, a, a vaccine effect and, and allowing for um, uh, manageable uh, trial sizes. But of course, um, all, the, all these events shown in this graphic were captured in each one of these trials and, and secondary analyses are, are enabled to, to study the vaccine effects on acquisition infection uh, as measured by seroconversion and um, severe COVID-19 disease and, and death. Um, so in terms of how vaccine efficacy has been evaluated, um, it has typically most commonly been evaluated using classical Cox proportional hazards regression models where vaccine efficacy is one minus the, the, S, the measured by one minus the hazard ratio of uh, COVID-19 in the vaccine versus placebo arms. Um, sometimes this is uh, stratified by randomization strata if applicable or um, by um, uh, allowing for a different baseline stratum, baseline hazard for um, different study sites given the, the heterogeneity, geographic heterogeneity in, in the, the epidemic. Um, and the, the, the primary analysis for most of these trials has been conducted in participants who were baseline negative for SARS-CoV-2 infection without evidence of prior infection based on laboratory testing. Uh, again, um, given the, the presumption that this would be the, the group of individuals who are most likely to benefit from vaccination. Um, but again, sub, you know, secondary supportive analyses conducted in all enrolled participants. Um, the success criteria were really stipulated very early on by US FDA and the WHO and, and um, and, and stipulated that, that a successful vaccine would have a point estimate for VE of above 50% with a, a lower bound on the 95% confidence interval above 30%. So ruling out a 30% null. And this really um, dictated the, the necessary size of these trials in, in order to ensure that this uh, criterion could be established or criterion could be met under a given design alternative. So specifically, um, uh, under a design alternative of a 60% vaccine efficacy, which was really what guided most of these trial designs and, and was um, a, a, a reasonable hypothesis as to the efficacy of these vaccines, remembering, of course, that vaccines against respiratory infections are often not wildly efficacious. Uh, it was not believed in advance that these vaccines would, would be wildly efficacious, remembering that, for example, flu vaccines in the annual flu vaccine has an estimated effectiveness of, of, of 40 to 50% in a given year. So, so under a 60% design alternative, um, one can calculate that, that one needs about 150 primary endpoint events to have 90% power to roll out the 30% null uh, under a, a two to one vaccine to placebo allocation. Um, so uh, we used uh, an event-driven design and, and um, calculated the total number of participants that needed to be enrolled by assuming how many would be baseline SARS-CoV-2 negative and what an assumed incidence of COVID-19 would be, uh, would likely be in the SARS-CoV-2 negative placebo recipients in order to identify the sample size that, that would be required to accrue that 150 primary endpoint events 
quickly. We wanted to ensure that, that, that those 150 primary events would, would accrue in a timely fashion, planning um, for our primary analysis to occur within about six months of trial start. So for example, assuming that 90% of the participants were baseline negative and assuming a 1% six month placebo incidence implied a sample size of 30,000 participants. And that's, that's really what, what drove the size of most of these trials. Um, the, the timing, really time was the commodity at the design stage of these trials. We wanted to ensure rapid reporting of results to, to the community. Um, so the, the, as I mentioned, it, it, these trials were sized to ensure that the primer analysis of when 150 events were accrued would occur within six months. And, and that interim analyses, which um, uh, many trials used a 50% information fraction to time the first interim analysis. We wanted to ensure that that first interim analysis would occur, would occur within about four months of, of trial start, again, to allow rapid reporting of, of results should there be early and definitive evidence of, of vaccine efficacy. Um, and then again, um, critical to continue to follow participants even after efficacy is established to definitively evaluate uh, long-term safety, long-term efficacy, and to evaluate endpoints that are rare and, and therefore require continual follow-up for adequate power. Um, so this is a, a snapshot, <laughs> not doing it justice, but just a snapshot of, of the results so far. And I've included in this table, uh, the results for, for the uh, four vaccines that have results uh, for the US, uh, US government funded trials, as well as for the Pfizer vaccine at the top, which was um, not a US government funded trial, but, it, but is a license, another licensed vaccine in the US. And um, uh, a couple of highlights from this table. Um, one is, is you can see the, the median post-vaccination follow-up. These are, these are results uh, based on th that were initially reported to the public and, and which were the basis for an emergency use authorization application. Um, and we can see that the, the median post vaccination follow up for each of these studies was very small. So, so these studies um, universally reported results at the first interim efficacy analysis. And, and accordingly, there was you know, a median of you know, about 1.5 to, to three months follow up post second vaccination that was available at that point in time. So, so very little little data, um, but this was seen as, as adequate on the, on the part of regulatory authorities, um, ultimately for, for establishing um, high efficacy and, and safety where, where most safety events for vaccines tend to occur within the first week of vaccination. Um, and um, another feature that we can see reflected on the side is generally speaking, very high estimates of vaccine efficacy, especially for the mRNA vaccines at the top. So again, this was really um, a, sh a surprise to the field. Um, I, I don't know of anyone who predicted that these vaccines would be as efficacious as they turned out to be. Another feature I wanna highlight is the estimated efficacy against severe disease on the far right uh, a critical secondary endpoint of these studies, but um, as you see, you know it is a rare endpoint, especially in the context of a phase three trial, and um, and precious few um, severe disease cases in these trials. Um, thus, you know, emphasizing the the need for continued follow up and really the need ultimately for um, for uh, observational data to to nail this question that all evidence right now points to very high efficacy against severe disease. And this is consistent with what we've seen for, for vaccines against other pathogens, especially other respiratory pathogens, where there's higher efficacy at preventing more severe events than less severe events. Um, so generally speaking, it's not reflected on this slide, but what we've seen in these trials is remarkably consistent levels of high efficacy across various subpopulations uh, defined based on demographics and at-risk characteristics. Um, what we have seen heterogeneity in is, is some evidence that began to emerge from these phase three trials in terms of heterogeneity uh, it, by uh, geographic region, uh, likely due to um, uh, differences in, um, in circulating variants of the virus. So, so this is a, a summary showing us um, a, a, a particular signal that began to emerge when these um, the earliest of these trials uh, started to, to be reported, which was in the context of the, the fall 2020, when um, uh, new variants began to emerge for, for this virus. 
and in particular uh, amongst these uh, studies that were conducted in South Africa, um, in South Africa, the, the, the beta variant began to emerge and became the dominant strain in November, November to December in, in South Africa. And you can see here, um, based on these uh, three studies in South Africa, that the point estimates for vaccine efficacy against disease are considerably lower than what was seen for those same vaccines in, in other regions of the world when, other, um, when the, the wild type virus was circulating. Um, um, importantly, however, for the Janssen trial at the bottom there that did manage to capture um, adequate number of severe disease events, uh, it does not look like um, there was diminished efficacy, um, uh, meaningfully diminished efficacy at, pre at preventing severe disease, which is which is really reassuring. But but generally speaking, these results really raised concerns that that continue today, and that, that really um, are are an important research question around uh, what is the efficacy against uh, current circulating variants, and what what is it likely to be against variants that have yet to emerge. So this is a, a leading uh, research question right now. Um, so, Holly, sorry, yes. um, there's a question for you in the chat. If you okay, want chat, chat Q and A. I mean, sorry, Q and A. Yeah. Yes. So this question is asking about proportional hazards and uh, time varying vaccine efficacy. So yes. Um, uh, so um, the short answer is that um, time varying vaccine efficacy was was definitely taken into account in in, in the sense that um, uh, design calculations um, uh, modeled um, uh, time varying vaccine efficacy and um, and and really the the structural way in which um, you know short in the short term proximal to vaccination time varying vaccine efficacy really manifests in um, for most vaccines, there's really ramping vaccine efficacy in between the first two doses. Vaccine efficacy is ramping up, and then it and then it likely receive, you know reaches some stasis point, and then potentially begins to decline. So, for the purposes of interim analyses, what was done structurally to account for that was only to count infection events that occurred post second dose. Um, but but of course, for for profiling, uh, aside from the issue of interim analyses for pro profiling vaccine efficacy. Um, uh, you know, alternative approaches are, are warranted. A, a key approach that, that we like to do and, and that has been done for each of these studies is to, to not just look at proportional hazards vaccine efficacy, but to, to measure vaccine efficacy in ways that, that respects the potential for time varying efficacy, uh, like looking at cumulative incidence, uh, ratio of cumulative incidence curves. Um, so, um, yeah, so, so, so the short answer is that time varying vaccine efficacy is, is definitely something that, that is well appreciated and taken into account here. Um, it's, it's um, it, and, and is a, is a, you know, the, the potential for waning vaccine efficacy is, is something that's, that's explicitly being studied and, and I'll get into it in a, in a couple of slides, how we're thinking to do that now. All right, uh, let me check a time and see, okay. So these are these are a number of questions that that remain um, at, at the point of primary analysis of each of these trials, um, including um, you know how durable is vaccine efficacy to the to the speakers to, to the question you know does vaccine efficacy wane at some point in time post second dose that's obviously a, a question on many people's minds these days, including policymakers who are considering booster vaccinations. Um, what's the long term safety profile? Related to those is is does vaccine efficacy differ by exposing variant and these are these are difficult to disentangle right now. Um, a, a leading research question is can immunological correlative protection be identified? Um, this would rapidly advance the development and and regulatory approval of new vaccines, variant vaccines, vaccines for new populations, etc. And finally, do vaccines um, prevent? acquisition of infection regardless of seroconversion and symptoms, and do they reduce onward transmission of virus to, to others? So I will try to summarize for each of these, um, the research that's underway to answer these questions and key statistical issues, although looking at the clock, I may not get through all of these. Um, oops, okay, here we go. So, so the first thing I wanna say is, um, once the, you know, a, a, a key issue was that once these 
uh, results began to be seen. The efficacy was so high, and especially in the context of a pandemic where there was such um, a, a critical need for vaccination of the population and, and desire for vaccine uh, from, by the trial participants as well as in the community at large. Um, and, and there was a groundwork laid for emergency youth authorization by the US FDA. There was um, much concern about what to do with the participants in these trials. Obviously from a, from a purely scientific vantage point, it would have been optimal to continue to follow the placebo recipients on placebo throughout the duration of the trial, but that was really seen as not feasible in the climate of a pandemic um, and, and really would not um, would, would not have enabled us to retain participants on study. We began to see even um, just within a week of uh, the emergency use authorization of the Pfizer vaccine, which happened a little bit before the emergency use authorization of the Moderna vaccine, there were already um, uh, hundreds of participants that began to uh, withdraw from the study in order to procure uh, Pfizer vaccination uh, via the EUA mechanism. So it was quickly realized that we needed to offer vaccine to the participants who were originally randomized to placebo, but at first blush that might um, uh, seem like that would prevent us from evaluating long-term safety and efficacy of the vaccines. And so um, there was a lot of thinking put into this and, and ultimately uh, th this notion of, of deferred vaccination was, um, was what was adopted and, um, and really has been put in place into each of the subsequent trials. It was really developed for the Moderna trial and has been adopted by each one of the subsequent trials. And I think we'll really change the vaccine field going forward. Um, it's a pretty simple idea. That, that the idea is that once efficacy has been established and if that efficacy is sufficiently high, if there's product available, if the circumstances warrant, the placebo recipients are offered vaccine at that point in time. Uh, you might say they are crossed over to vaccine. Ideally, this would be done in a blinded fashion. So individuals who are initially randomized to vaccine would also be offered a placebo at that point in time. And some of these studies have done it in a blinded fashion. Others have uh, taken a more practical approach and done it in an open label fashion. And then follow-up continues um, uh, so that longer term safety and efficacy can be evaluated. And, and what um, our group articulated, and this was really work that was led by Dean Fullman at the NIH and, and really was um, critical for, for ensuring the future success of these studies, was, was to articulate that uh, longer term vaccine efficacy and safety could still be evaluated even if this design approach were taken. And here's a schematic just to um, make intuitive how that works. Um, that if, if, for example, for a hypothetical trial, one were to randomize to vaccine or placebo and follow those participants in a blinded fashion from August to February and estimate on the basis of those data an estimated vaccine efficacy of 80%. And then uh, you know, following evidence of efficacy, offering vaccine to the placebo recipients and vice versa, a placebo to the vaccine recipients. And, and suppose that one were to observe in March through September, an infection split of, uh, of 60 to 30 in the in the the, the, the original vaccinees versus the, the new vaccinees. So under the assumption that um, the benefit of vaccination to it, it is it, to the, the short-term benefit of vaccination is the same in March to September as it was in August to February, then one can take that early point estimate of 80% vaccine efficacy and apply it to the new vaccinees to infer that, that if there were 30 cases in the, in the newly vaccinated, there must have been 150 if, if one were to have a concurrent follow-up of a placebo arm. And then um, with, with filling in essentially this, this inferred placebo group, one can evaluate the, the, the durability of vaccine efficacy by contrasting the number of events in, in the original vaccinees, 60, versus this inferred placebo of 150 in this example to, to identify that while vaccine efficacy in period one was 80%, it appeared to decline to 60% in period two. And so in this way, one could um, infer a, a, a evidence of waning vaccine efficacy even under this design. But of course it relies on this critical assumption, which is that the short-term benefit of vaccination is the same for the new vaccinees as it was for the original vaccinees. And, um, so that approach was, you know, seemed reasonable until we began to really see um, uh, what was happening with these new variants and, and the extent to which 
these were going to be confounded with uh, the different periods of follow-up that we had. So, so this is a figure um, from the Nextrain platform, which is an excellent platform for uh, visualizing and, and ascertaining uh, the frequency of different var circulating variants um, of SARS-CoV-2 and many other pathogens uh, led by Trevor Bedford and, and colleagues at the Fred Hutch. And, and you can see um, that over the blinded period of follow-up for each of these studies, there was relatively little heterogeneity in, in circulating variants, at least in the US. Um, and so what that means is that, that this period one is, is virtually all uh, so, sort of uh, wild type virus. Whereas uh, post uh, crossover of placebos, there, there's much greater heterogeneity in, with regard to circulating variants. There's, there's many more uh, variants of concern. And, um, oops. And, and, and now of course, uh, what we see in the US is, is all Delta variant. And we didn't have any Delta variant infections prior to, to the time point of crossover. So this really, um, compromises this constancy assumption that was that was mentioned on the previous slide and, and suggests that we really are going to need um, not just the phase three trial data, but we're going to be heavily reliant on observational data in order to evaluate uh, how vaccine efficacy uh, differs according to exposing variant. So, so this is an active area of research. Here's one diagram to show one approach to doing it. And, and this, this is an approach that relies on population modeling and surveillance data to uh, essentially um, infer your placebo group. So, so here's the concept here um, that, um, you know, again, we, we have a hypothetical trial that, that follows individuals in a blinded fashion vaccine versus placebo from August to February, um, a, a time period over which we have sort of pre-Delta, non-Delta uh, viruses circulating. And, um, and, 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 and simultaneously, we, we have what is, what is called a model placebo. We have an, we have an estimate of what the incidence of COVID was, and, and it's and it's highly tailored to the trial. So, so it's an estimate that is that is estimating COVID for the local areas where we have clinical trial sites for the um, uh, protect, protecting the incidence of COVID as defined in the study protocol and 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 taking into account the, the, the individual level characteristics of the study participants. And suppose that based on that model placebo, we would estimate that. Um, that, that the model placebo would, ha would have 150 events. Um, and, and, and so in this, in this um, blinded period of follow-up, we can actually estimate how, how off the modeling is. Um, we can estimate what, what I call an offset, which is to say we, we can estimate ba based on these numbers that, that the model placebo it, it, you know, it, it pr suggests that incidence is about 20% or sorry, sorry, that the observed incidence in the placebo arm is about 20% lower than would be predicted based on the model. And then if we look at the, the, the post-crossover period, oops, if we look at the post-crossover period, um, which is, is the period of time between March and September, where we now have potentially um, both pre-Delta variants circulating as well as a predominance of Delta variants circulating, and if we observe the, the number of, of, of COVID endpoints in the, uh, the original vaccinees and in the, the newly vaccinated uh, according to their infecting variant, um, and then simultaneously we continue this model placebo forward, um, if we make this critical assumption that the, that the offset, this 20% lower offset, uh, applies to each of the variants and, and also is constant over time, and those seem to be reasonable assumptions from the, from the data that we've seen, then we can infer um, the, the, uh, the missing placebo incidence and a number of endpoints um, by variant and, and fill in you know, that, 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 that there would have been 40 pre-Delta COVID events in an inferred placebo, and there would have been 96 Delta events in, in this inferred placebo. And then with all those data filled in, we can estimate um, you know, both variant-specific vaccine efficacy and, and how variant-specific vaccine efficacy uh, changes, you know, from period one to period two. And of course, this all generalizes to, you know, continuous time and, and, and differing time periods and so on, but this is just a schematic to, to fix the ideas. Um, so this is one way we can do this sort of analysis. There are other ways that are under investigation. There's other types of constancy assumptions that one can make. And in fact, of course, one could be entirely reliant on the observational data as many studies are doing 
um, to, to use an observational data on, on its own to, to attempt to estimate uh, vaccine efficacy against uh, newly emergent variants. Um, so another big bucket question, uh, really uh, the, the holy grail of vaccine research is, is the development of immunological correlates of risk and, and correlates of protection. And, and a, 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 um, what we seek is, is that a biomarker that predicts the level of vaccine efficacy that, that is um, you know, manifest by, by a given vaccine. And this would have um, you know, really major benefits in terms of advancing public health. It would advance and, and massively accelerate the development and licensure of new vaccines because, you know, if, if we if we knew a, a biomarker that predicted the level of vaccine efficacy, we could do several hundred person studies to to evaluate whether that vaccine works instead of tens of thousand person studies as under the traditional approach. And and importantly, you know, we can't do these these massive trials in every population for every vaccine. We can't do them for variant versions of vaccines that are now being developed. To, to, to enhance protection against Delta and newly emergent variants. Um, so we really need, it, it's, it's really arguable that we really need to establish an immunological correlate of protection uh, to, to permit uh, rapid development, advancement, and regulatory approval of, of these new vaccines and vaccines for new populations. And if we had this correlate, we can also you know, really readily uh, assess the durability of vaccine efficacy and, and and how protected a given population is predicted to be on the basis of their immune responses. And this is, you know, for all of us who've worked in HIV for years, and, and those of you who I know are very active in, in HIV therapeutics, this is really conceptually quite analogous to what was accomplished for HIV with the development and, app and application of HIV viral load as a surrogate for disease, which had, you know, major benefits for, for advancement of, of therapeutics for HIV. So this was really recognized um, as, as a critical priority from the get-go and, and, a, and a framework was set up to ensure that this would be successful. Um, and that framework for, for the phase three, you know, Operation Warp Suite trials um, consists of identifying harmonized immunological assays and, and laboratories that would, that would profile the immune responses in a common way across multiple phase three trials, a common statistical group that could apply you know, uh, the same study design and the same analytical methods across the trials and would have access to the data to do meta-analyses. And, and, um, and importantly, that this statistical group has, has massive amounts of expertise. Again, here, this is leadership by Peter Gilbert, um, who, who really, um, you know, just set the bar for um, uh, uh, rigorous uh, foundational frameworks for, for, you know, applying multiple statistical frameworks uh, to, to really um, comprehensively interrogate from, from all sorts of different directions uh, the, the ability of immune response to predict uh, a, a risk of COVID and, and um, protection from COVID. So um, I'm gonna get, give just a snapshot of the results that are emerging. Much of this is still work to be done, um, but, but a couple of key principles. One is that a, a, a harmonized um, case cohort you know, two-phase case cohort sampling design has been applied for each of the, the phase three trials uh, that basically consists of sampling people who developed COVID over the course of the study and, and a random uh, uh, baseline subcohort. And then looking um, so far for, for the Moderna study, there are uh, data that, that exist for, for two um, antibody assays, binding antibodies and pseudovirus neutralization antibodies. Um, each of those assays have generated uh, readouts for two different uh, assay readouts. And we're looking at those um, immunological readouts at day 29, so to just the day of the, the, the second dose, as well as at day 57, which is about two weeks post second dose. And, and <clears throat> looking at those immune responses as predictors of subsequent risk of COVID and subsequent um, protection from COVID in terms of vaccine efficacy. Um, so this is a visual of the results. The high level summary is that um, the results look good. You know, all four of the pre-specified antibody markers at both day 29 and at day 57 are statistically significant inverse correlates of risk. They've passed pre-specified family-wise multiplicity error rate corrections. Um, you know, you can, you can see the, the estimated hazard ratios per tenfold increase in the markers on the right-hand side. You can visually see the, the results on the, on the left-hand side <clears throat> for um, just one of the markers, the pseudovirus neutralization assay as measured by the, the ID50 marker, showing that, that, that risk decreases uh, as a function of the marker. Um, 
uh, with about a, a remarkable 33-fold uh, increase, uh, decrease in risk if you if you compare the, the 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 kind of high end of the range versus the low end of the range. There, this is an estimate based on the Cox proportional hazards model. Estimation has also been done using non-parametric methods to um, to you know explore what 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 the shape of this function actually looks like, and then. You know, those analyses are based purely on observable data, simple, simple analyses, easy to interpret, easy to understand. Uh, also, what's been done is, is a host of uh, causal inference based analyses that look at um, the ability of the markers to predict vaccine efficacy. So this is a, a controlled VE type analysis. Um, and in and this analysis, each of these markers been, has been interrogated. You can see uh, on the on the right hand side, the, the results for this uh, ID50 titer, suggesting that um, um, this marker in, in, in indeed predicts quite a quite a large gradient in vaccine efficacy with with an estimated 50% vaccine efficacy at the lower lower undetectable limit of this of this marker up to about a 96% efficacy with with a one an ID50 titer of a thousand, um, so about a five fold increase in vaccine efficacy comparing a titer of five to one thousand. Um, again, statistically significant and, and remarkably consistent results across the, the four different antibody markers. Still pending for this study is looking at live virus neutralization as, as a marker. And, and, and looking forward, you know, these data will certainly be interpreted in light of a host of other critical data that, that really form the ultimate package for um, uh, regulatory use of this marker as, as a surrogate endpoint. You know, we won't just need data from these phase three trials. That will be part of the package looking for consistency in evidence across different types of analysis, across different endpoints. Also, what's been looked at so far is just the COVID disease endpoint. We'll be looking at temporal ordering, whether or not the correlate uh, has, a, has a weaker correlation with the endpoint as you get further out from the, the time point when the marker was measured. So consistency um, and, and cogency of the effect is, is really important, but that'll be part of the package, putting it together with data from challenge studies, from mechanistic studies, from studies of natural history of infections, and importantly, from monoclonal antibody studies, which really established that, you know, if you give them the antibody to somebody that they that they do have a reduced uh, risk of, of, of disease. The final question I want to mention as an open question is, um, do COVID-19 vaccines reduce onward transmission? Uh, we see this in the, in the news uh, pretty much every day these days. It was appreciated very, very well early on that, that that was an intentional choice. The phase three trials were not designed to address this question. Um, in retrospect, it's an interesting question whether or not it should have been interrogated more specifically with the phase three trials, but they, they weren't intended to answer the questions. Of course, vaccines um, really have two key ways in which they can reduce transmission of infection. They could um, potentially uh, block infection uh, to, from the get-go and thus break the, the onward transmission chain. But even if they weren't completely effective at blocking acquisition of infection, they could reduce transmission by making uh, someone who acquires infection despite having been vaccinated less infectious and, and therefore um, reduce the likelihood that they pass infection on to their household members or, or other close contacts. So as a reminder, the phase three studies collected blood at a handful of time points so that they could look at uh, the ability of the vaccines to present uh, seroconversion. And, and they also, not shown in this figure, but they also collected um, uh, samples so that, that any individual who became symptomatic and had COVID-19, uh, we could study the vaccine effects on, on their viral load at a handful of their post-COVID diagnosis visits. But the, but the phase three trials fall short in the sense that they will inc we, we know that they incompletely capture asymptomatic infections because of the, the way the testing was done. It was quite infrequent. And, um, and, and it, you know, it, it doesn't provide us a, a complete picture of, of the viral load um, because it's only available in individuals who, who were symptomatic. And there was no effort in the phase three trials to actually capture onward transmission of infection. They, they weren't designed to do this. Um, and there are you know, major challenges with doing this for, for many pathogens, but especially for SARS-CoV-2. Um, so what we've learned over the last 18 months is that you know, absent intervention, this, this um, pathogen has a large burden of asymptomatic infection. There are a lot of people out there in some populations, it's 50% it's of people we estimate uh, might be asymptomatically infected and that asymptomatic infections 
are, um, uh, do have a high rate of transmitting infection to others. But confounding the, the situation is that the period of time over which someone is infectious is likely quite short. It may be on the order of just one to two days. And, um, and, and also, um, there's evidence that, that some fraction of people never seroconvert. So, so for some pathogens, looking at seroconversion is a, is a useful kind of catch-all for catching all infections. But for SARS-CoV-2, we know that that doesn't actually work. So what, so what, what that implies is that to capture um, infections and, and to identify onward transmission of infection, one has to do very frequent systematic PCR testing and rapid identification and testing of, of a person's close contacts in order to fully you know, capture potential vaccine effects on onward transmission. So this is really difficult to do. And this is why we don't yet have an answer, a definitive answer to this question. Um, I'm gonna highlight just uh, several sources of data of ongoing studies um, where there's you know, data on this question. There's a, there's a whole host of observational studies that are trying to get at this. They're quite hard, heterogeneous. It's hard to describe them succinctly, um, but oftentimes, you know, they're coming from the UK or they're coming from Israel, where there's a national healthcare system and 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 the infections are being ascertained by by looking at medical records. Um, it's it's difficult to interpret these studies because the, the what prompted a some a person to come in for testing is is not is not clear, and and they're still in the context of of kind of the existing population surveillance, which is tends to be quite infrequent testing. Um, and, and, and accordingly, uh, you know, any studies that, you know, there are now a, a handful of studies that have tried to look at um, transmission of infection within a household, it's quite difficult in that context to ascertain who infected who, because the testing just isn't frequent enough. Um, another ongoing study is called the SNF study, uh, a cool name. Um, it's a nested sub-study of the Novavax phase three trial that's asking a subset of participants to swab their noses twice weekly, um, and that will enable profiling of viral load for individuals who become infected despite having been vaccinated. And another key study that I'm involved with is, um, is in uh, young people in the US, and oops, uh, um, it actually um, randomizes to uh, immediate or, or deferred vaccination with the mRNA, uh, the, the Moderna vaccine, uh, about 12,000 individuals, um, and, and also has a parallel observational cohort of individuals who don't want to be vaccinated. And these all these participants are all asked to, to swab their noses daily so we can capture all asymptomatic infections, profile their viral load, and then we actually enroll and test contacts once they become infected. Um, so this study is, is also ongoing. I wanna highlight just a few statistical challenges um, in these studies to ascertain vaccine effects on transmission. One is, a, is a, a familiar challenge to statisticians working in prospective studies over years, length bias. You know, when we have data from studies that did infrequent testing, what that means is that individuals with shorter duration infections are less likely to be, less likely to be captured. And given that we assume that vaccines reduce the duration of infection, what that means is that we're less likely able to capture infections in the vaccine group as compared to the unvaccinated group. Um, and, and we don't capture you know, the viral load of, of the vaccinees who, who have you know, short durations of infection. So, so that um, is expected to bias our results and we expect that it actually overestimates, uh, yields an overestimate of vaccine efficacy against infection. We also have confounding. But, but I wanna be precise, you know, we have confounding in the sense that we expect that individuals who are vaccinated um, might behave differently and, and have, have different exposure to the virus than individuals who are unvaccinated. But it also affects their transmission. Individuals who are vaccinated um, might um, uh, mix more in the population or mix less <laughs> in the population. Um, which affects their likelihood of transmitting uh, to, to their household members in close contacts. And it's exceptionally difficult to, to measure these behaviors in order to try to adjust for, for the bias that, that's caused by them. We also have the issue of misclassification error in identifying transmission events. So um, especially in the context where there's very infrequent testing, you know, how can we determine whether person A infected person B or whether uh, a, an external person who we didn't even, you know, see in our study infected both of them. So, so we know there's misclassification error and um, we know that it can be substantial. We know that it, it is potentially a differential level of error in, in individuals who are vaccinated versus unvaccinated with, for example, 
uh, unvaccinated individuals potentially mixing more in the population and then um, that yielding um, uh, gr greater error in, in, in capturing potential transmission events or, or correctly classifying them. Another issue is, is that um, if, if we're comparing uh, uh, transmission rates from vaccinated people, who vaccinated index cases to, to their close contacts versus unvaccinated in case, index cases to their close contacts, um, it, it may be difficult in these studies uh, to disentangle the effect of vaccinating the index case versus the effect of having vaccinated their contacts. And this is because, especially in the US where vaccines have become politicized, you know, vaccinated people tend to travel with and have close contact with other vaccinated people and unvaccinated people with unvaccinated people. So it's, it's, it's getting increasingly difficult to, um, again, disentangle the vaccine effect on acquisition of infection from the vaccine effect on um, transmitting virus to others given that you've become infected. So these are just some of the statistical challenges. I haven't done justice to any of these. Um, but I, I wanted to, um, you know, my high level message is, is that I think as a statistical community, we've, we've really, um, you know, set the bar here. We had a highly successful first generation phase three trial designs that, 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 you know, achieved what we needed to achieve. They provided rapid results with really clear and definitive answers that were adaptive to emerging data and emerging circumstances and resulted in very rapid emergency use authorization of, of three highly effective vaccines in the US. Uh, hopefully um, uh, more to come and, and, um, and leading to higher vaccination rates globally. Um, but yet there, there remain a number of open questions that are still under investigation that we've talked about. And I think the, the short message is that, you know, these phase three data alone will, will not suffice. We're gonna need to, to combine the phase three dial data with uh, external data and, um, and, and, um, and, and do this in a, in a careful and rigorous fashion to definitively answer these questions as we move forward. Okay, happy to take any questions. So Holly, there's a, Q, a question in the Q&A actually that kind of gets to this external data um, point that you made. Can you in, use data from unvaccinated to confirm an inferred placebo rate? Yeah, um, well, okay, um, potentially, uh, you know, so, so, so there's many sources, I, I guess I would say there's many sources of data to infer a, a missing, inferred, you know, a missing placebo group. Um, the, the challenge with um, relying exclusively, at least on data from the unvaccinated population would be, um, you know, concern about, you know, differential behavior between individuals who are vaccinated versus individuals who are unvaccinated. Um, we know that that's that's a reality, um, and so so what we try to do is 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 you know uh, address that a bit more carefully by um, uh, again using using data internal to the trial to infer the placebo or or using um, uh, modeling that that tries to estimate the placebo for people like the vaccinees, you know. Yes. Okay. So this person is asking, Edward is asking about the platform trial. Why would it have not worked? Um, I agree with you from a theoretical vantage point. It, it, it would have been appealing and, and obviously resource efficient and statistically optimal to, to study all these vaccines in a, in a, in a single trial. The, the, the challenge was really the practicality of doing that, that, that doing that requires getting enormous amount of buy-in from five vaccine developers whose products are all on a different timeline and who um, all have uh, different points of view on endpoints and specimen schedule and um, uh, you know, operational issues and clinical trial sites, et cetera, et cetera. So it was really a, a practical choice um, or, or a practical considerations that, that determined that, um, that this would not have been feasible, at least in, a, in, a, in, in the expedient fashion that we needed it to be. Like we, we, we really needed to launch these trials as quickly as possible and get results as quickly as possible. And I think it, in, the, you know, in, in, in retrospect, I think it was a wise choice. I mean, if we look at the speed with which these trials rolled out uh, with the Sanofi trial, for example, just starting in May, you know, it was considerably delayed. So, uh, you know, in retrospect, I think, I think it was the right decision. Okay, so um, why not use, in terms of immunological correlates, why not use 
COVID viral load or some variant in the, in the way you described for HIV viral load. So, so COVID viral load, SARS-CoV-2 viral load, is thought to be a, a, a reasonable proxy. I'm going to not say surrogate, but a reasonable proxy for risk of transmission or, or for infectiousness. But, but, but it's not, um, you, you know, it, it can't be a proxy for, you know, d does, the, does the vaccine work because it's not, it's, um, you know, it's only measured, it's only defined in individuals who, who become infected. So, so, so a, a biomarker proxy for um, vaccine efficacy against infection requires that the, that, the, that the biomarker be measurable, you know, before somebody develops the endpoint and ideally soon after they're vaccinated. The, the most useful biomarker, you know, the most useful biomarker is something that's measurable, you know, soon after the point of vaccination. So all you have to do is vaccinate somebody, wait a little bit of time to measure that thing and you know if the vaccine kind of took. Thank you, Holly, for such an excellent presentation. This was really fascinating and really prescient, um, given all of our interests in these studies and understanding how it came about and um, really amazing work that I, I, on behalf of you guys and all your colleagues at Fred Hatch. So thanks so much for visiting us and telling us all about the, the work that you guys have been doing. Great. Uh, you know, very well, busy 18 months for you. Th thanks for... Thanks for having me, and um, uh, I'll leave you with this acknowledgement slide of, of the, the, you know, the massive team of, of people. Um, thanks for the virtual visit. <laughs> yeah, hopefully we'll be able to uh, uh, organize a in-person visit in an upcoming series. series. Okay, thanks right. everyone for attending. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks.